All right. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Data Diversity webinar, Data Strategy. Plans are useless, but planning is invaluable. It is the latest installment in the monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken, brought to you in partnership with Data Blueprint. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag data ed. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle for that feature. And to continue the conversation and networking after the webinar, just go to community.dataversity.net. To answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording, and likewise, we'll send a link to the recording of the session, as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter is an internationally recognized data management thought leader. Many of you already know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide. He has more than 30 years of experience, has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. Peter is also the founding director of Data Blueprint. He has written dozens of articles and 11 books. The most recent is Your Data Strategy. Peter has experience with more than 50, 500 data management practices in 20 countries and consistently named as a top data management expert. Some of the most important and largest organizations in the world have sought out his and Data Blueprint's expertise. Peter has spent multi-year immersions with groups as diverse as the U.S. Department of Defense, Deutsche Bank, Nokia, Wells Fargo, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Walmart. And with that, let me turn everything over to Peter to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. And welcome, and thank you, Shannon, for being patient with us. So we had some uh, little technical difficulties there we had to correct, but uh, we are actually all ready to go with this now. So let's jump right in. The real key for this, of course, is that most people focus on the end product in their data strategy. And there's a quote I'll use a little bit later on from uh, our previous president and general, Dwight David Eisenhower, that says, plans are useless, but planning itself is invaluable. And the reason for that is because most people, when they dive into data, don't really understand what it is they're going to be experiencing here. So we have a fair amount of uh, uh, stuff that's got to work in order to make all this work. and Unfortunately, most companies are failing in their efforts to become data-driven. Peter? So, yes? Your, your computer just booted you up. We just lost you. Entirely? Yeah, you just log back in. Wow. Uh, we've got the audio still, so um, just need the computer login. I'm afraid if it leaves the – I'm still in the event. If I leave it, it's probably going to hang up, Shannon, so I'll have to do the whole thing. No, you won't have – it's because it, your phone is separate, so – because you called in, so. Um, you're not logged in. You're, gonna, you're about to be booted out. Yep. Coming back. Sorry, folks. Tech is great when it works. Mm-hmm. Hey, we're having so many problems with your – Oh, I can at least talk while we're doing that, so uh, let's see if we can get <laughs> We can't hear you. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, the real key is those first two slides are just talking specifically about the fact that uh, companies are actually themselves admitting that they're having trouble doing data. And what the, a couple of the findings that I'll share you in the, pa in the, uh, the notes there when you get them uh, is that the um, – the vast majority of companies are realizing that data is a lot more complicated than they originally thought it was going to be and that they're having all kinds of really significant problems. Um, Shannon, I think the Internet is dead here at VCU. Okay, send me your slide. Yeah, oh, well, right. 400 oh, megabyte presentation. Hey That's not going to happen. Uh, so what else can we do? Everybody's on here. I've actually Have your hot spot? Ooh, good idea. Let's try. See, I'm oh, panicking, and she's keeping a little head. That's my job. 
<laughs> Todd wants to know if we know how to tap dance. Yes, but mm-hmm. I don't know that you'll be able to see it. <laughs> Hear it. <laughs> Fun time. Ah. Okay, I think we've got it now. All right, join the event. Can you hear me? Yes. And. Oh, oh and then you're visible. <gasps> Amazing. <laughs> hey, we may be, we may be able to do a fundraiser to uh, see us tap dance. <laughs> data governance jeopardy I love it <laughs> what's a data dictionary <laughs> oh, you're muted and let me give you controls okay there we go and uh, the presenter you are a presenter and we're there and we're there. Ooh. All right. You can see? Yes. All right. Good. Yes. Um, Take it away. So, anyway, point, point of these slides, I'll just very quickly go through them. I would go through them in more detail. But people are not paying attention and doing the right kinds of things in order to be successful with data. And, of course, part of that is, is a strategy on this as well. We're getting some fairly good objective data, though, in terms of people that are doing big data and, you know, all sorts of things. So this is uh, Randy Bean's annual insight that he does uh, every year, and he's just released his other one, his, his this year's one, so we've got to go back and look at those. But you'll notice, again, some of these numbers in here where how many organizations are taking or thinking about taking steps in that direction in order to get going. And this is one that I find tremendously useful. What types of differentiation do you have in terms of job title, data job titles within your organizations? Uh, that's a really good leading indicator on that. Again, 80%, uh, sorry, 90% are experiencing data challenges. No problem with that. 70% are managing data within departments instead of trying to do it across the entire enterprise. And finally, we've still got an awful lot of companies, 60% that are reporting to IT on there. Now, I'm going to put something else up here for just a quick second. This has a little bit of audio on it, so uh, see if we can get it to work. If I was doing this live, I would ask you guys to raise your hands when you recognize this song. Now, what you see in there is, of course, a beautiful video of Bruce Springsteen doing a show in Melbourne, Australia. And what I want you to think about in terms of a data strategy is that Bruce Springsteen doesn't appear on stage with a set list and do the same set every night. In fact, that's one of the things he's known for not doing is improvising. He does a tremendous job of this. And he told the band two hours before they went on stage, hey, I think it'd be really nice to honor the Australians, since we're going to be playing in Melbourne, Australia, with a song that is done by Australians, in this case, the Bee Gees. And I'll tell you, in 1977, when I graduated from high school, if there was a song I hated more than anything in the world, it was Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. But if you go to YouTube, you can see this video in its whole. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing because he does a great job with the music. And this is the key. You've got to have some good music to do this. And in data, you've got to have a good plan. But there's another part of it that most people miss. And when I look at how people are doing data strategies worldwide at this point, I see an awful lot of emphasis on trying to write the world's best pop song the very first time. And it's just not possible because only through practice as well as good material can you actually come up with something that does equate to really good music. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today is specifically looking at strategy and saying, hey, it's an inherently repetitive process that can be easily improved with practice. It is dependent because data strategy exists only to support the organizational strategy. That in the early phases of maturity, process is much more important than the product on this. The output, the plans are of limited value and you always discount the obstacles that you're going to run into on this. Randy Bean's uh, findings show this year after year, people and process problems are 95% of the problems in data and not the technology piece. And finally, how does one get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. 
So we're going to dive through this pretty quickly just to make sure I cover all the material, but we're going to talk about a data strategy and how a data strategy specifies the data assets that are to be used to support the organizational strategy. And we're going to look at what is strategy, what is a data strategy, and how do the two of them work together. Then we're going to take a look at why data strategy and data governance are interdependent. You need to have this because both data strategy and data governance are focused on improving your organization's data, improving the way people use their data, and once you've got better data and better people skills, then you can use and improve the way your people use data to support your organizational strategy. We'll talk about some specific prerequisites. Most organizations have a definitive uh, set of things that they need to get through in order to do this and compensate for the lack of data deficiencies. And we talked last webinar, which was back in December, about the seven deadly sins. Then we'll get into the iterations on this. And really, once you learn the process of doing this, it becomes a matter of as simple as it is on the shampoo bottles, although be careful, if you follow the directions on the shampoo bottles, lather, rinse, and repeat, you would never actually leave the shower. Well, let's get started on this and dive in and talk about what is the word strategy. Now, strategy is currently derived from the military uh, of these things. About 1950, though, you'll notice on the Google graph there of the use of the word strategy over time, that business has got a hold of it because uh, there's a lot more business people than there are military people, and they went, wow, strategy is great. We can do this great thing and do all sorts of strategy work. A better definition of strategy is a pattern in a stream of decisions. Anything else beyond that is really complicated. And to prove that to you, I'm going to give you three examples of strategy, two very quickly, and then a third one that is more complex. The first one is Walmart's previous business strategy. Many of you actually think you know it already. Every day, low price. Well, okay, that's good. That means when somebody's making a decision at Walmart, they err on the side of making the customer have the lowest price, they will never get beaten up for anything along those lines. It's got to be in the strategy simple enough that all of the million plus people that work at Walmart know what to do. And believe me, they have done a great job of doing this. Everybody understands it. Another definition of, excuse me, another instance of strategy is Wayne Gretzky uh, as a wonderful sports enthusiast. He uh, puts down his strategy for winning hockey games, he skates to where he thinks the puck is going to be. After all, the puck is a piece of plastic. It's hard plastic. It runs around on ice, moves much faster than people. And if you're going to chase the puck, good luck. You will never beat any of Wayne Gretzky's records. And finally, our third one is a sort of a a little bit more complicated one, it's an example right out of history. Napoleon in the blue is facing two armies that are bigger than he. The red is the British and the black is the Prussians. Now, how does one beat the enemy when their forces are bigger? The answer is divide and conquer. So let's take a look at what divide and conquer actually means in the context of this strategy. First of all, Napoleon noticed that there were two supply lines supplying these two armies. The British were being supplied out of a, uh, the English Channel in Ostend in Belgium, and the Prussians were being um, supplied out of Liege, and they are two separate places. Now, Napoleon knew very well that if you hit the army at exactly the right position, by dividing them, they may, may back up. If you hit them really hard, they may fall backwards. And if they fall back, they are more likely to fall back towards their food than away from their food. So the first step is divide, and that was this attempt here. And the second part was conquer. So conquer means, okay, I've got this large army, and I need everybody in the army to turn to the right and defeat first the Prussians, and then everybody turn to the left, and everybody beat the British. If I get half of the people doing it one way and half doing it the other way, it is not going to work. And, of course, it didn't in this case. This was Waterloo, and uh, we know that that did not work out well for him. But that complex strategy is taught still in the military uh, environments here as an example of good strategy. So let's review this complex strategy for just a minute. Hit both armies at just the right spot, divide, and then everybody in my army turn to the left, excuse me, turn to the right and defeat the British and then defeat the Prussians. But if I don't do that, then we are going to lose. And of course, I want you to do all of this while somebody is shooting at you, which doesn't make it easy. 
it wasn't easy. He didn't actually win this battle, and that is where strategy comes in. So I mentioned at the top our previous president and general, Dwight David Eisenhower, has a wonderful quote that I use all the time. In preparing for battle, I've always found that plans are useless, but that the planning is indispensable. And in my professional experience, I have looked at hundreds and hundreds of organizations' data strategies, and most of them end up on a shelf and are simply unuseful. And the reason they aren't useful is, one, they're too complicated, but two, Mike Tyson has a wonderful quote, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. So let's go back to our strategy, a pattern and a stream of decisions. And now let's look at it in the context of a data strategy. Our data strategy in this case is the highest guidance available to organizations, focusing on data-related activities excuse me, focusing data-related activities on business goal achievement and providing guidance for folks when faced with a stream of decisions or uncertainties. Now let's talk specifically about data governance for a minute. And I like the definition, data governance is managing data with guidance. Any definition that's more complicated than that is likely to be misunderstood by people who are outside of your domain. Although I do like to add one additional word into that, which is managing data decisions with guidance. And this is the reason we have to be in a position to impact the results of those decisions because there have been too many poor data decisions over the years. So guidance says, well, how is the data used? What business processes consume it? Where does it share? Can I move Brazilian data into Ecuador? Uh, whatever. But most importantly about everything else, in what order should I approach the list that I'm trying to figure out? Because it is a non-trivial problem in order to do that. So if we look at these two in context, data strategy says what are the data assets doing to, supply, to support data strategy. And governance then is about how well is that data strategy working. Of course, I already mentioned that this has to be done in the context of making absolutely certain that our data strategy only supports the organizational strategy. There is no other purpose for it. And we've got some other related things that IT and other pieces are working on. I generally don't like to show this picture a whole lot because it just makes it really, really complicated. I think it does present a good view of the world, but I wouldn't do that in the public. I'd keep it at this level here, which is to say that let's just talk about how well is the data strategy working. And oh, by the way, the data strategy should be expressed in terms of business goals. And the language of data governance, if it's not metadata, becomes even more problematic because it's hard to keep things focused, especially for people who really do not understand that aspect of what's going on. So most people will think we have an organizational strategy and that you have a IT strategy and then you have a data strategy. And I say this is so incorrectly wrong, it is unbelievable. So pull the buzzer on it, do not let people do this. Instead, the correct way to do it is to look at your IT strategy as complementary to your data strategy and vice versa. In fact, if I had to, I would say your data strategy should drive more of your IT needs than your IT needs drive your data strategy. But I have seen strategies over the years, literally, where they say, well, we're going to rely on big data. Now, we know that big data is succeeding at the same rate of most IT projects, which is to say about 30% of them achieve a positive return on investment. Uh, data science, of course, is so ill-defined, we don't have any good measurements on that, and it gets worse. People will say, well, we're just going to rely on analytics or SAP or Microsoft or Google or Amazon. All these fine companies are going to take care of all of that. Well, again, a data strategy has to be very simple and describe how it's going to work in supporting the organization. The strategy also, of course, has to do with better understanding that data is an asset that is typically less well recognized than most organizational assets that are in there. Again, cash, no problem. People understand this. Uh, I'll just go with that. We also have to understand, too, that a good important part of our data is that not all of our data is equal. Now, data that is better organized does increase in value. If I can put my hands on it quickly, that's knowledge worker productivity and time to market and other types of time-related decisions on that. And therefore, poor data management practices are costing your organization's time, money, and effort, which is unfortunate. And the really sad part about it is that 80% of your data in your organization is rot. 
you may say to yourself, goodness, that's a pretty strong statement. Well, the only argument I get over it is that it's not 80%, it's 85 I had one organization tell me 90%. ROT, of course, stands for data that is redundant, obsolete, or trivial. And if it is redundant, obsolete, or trivial, why are you spending any time managing it at all? You should be paring it down, culling it, if you will, in order to get it out of there. My wife added the attribute incomplete as well, and so we could actually call it riot, but I think ROT actually works out a little better than that. When you look at data assets compared to other types of assets, data is the only asset that you have that isn't depletable, it isn't degradable, it is durable in nature at the strategic level. So data assets really do compare very favorably to other types of assets. And yet most people still go back and say, well, data is the new oil. And again, I say this is the wrong way to think about data. We never think about what happens to the gasoline when we take it out of the gas pump and put it in our car and consume it. So change that slightly when somebody says oil and say, instead, let's call it the new soil. There's two reasons this is a better metaphor. First of all, the oil is a production function, whereas data is most valuable when it's reused rather than when it's used. And so the key here is that data is not the new oil, but the new soil. And when you plant things, you don't just randomly walk about the yard or the forest or whatever and scatter seeds everywhere and hope good things happen. That's called evolution. We're doing something a little bit more purposeful than that. Secondly, we never plant something on Monday and expect to consume it on Friday. It, it takes much more time in order to do this. Now, Got a lot of groups that say it's the new bacon, and that's fine, too, if you need to sell it that way. But really, data does deserve its own strategy as a strategic asset. It deserves attention that is on par with similar organizational assets, and it requires professional administration to make up for past neglect. So if we look at what's actually happening in the data world here, what we will start to see is that organizations are able to jump in and do a lot with data when they put their time and attention into it. So let's get to a motivational slide on this. Sorry, I'm going to skip a slide on this because I had one that didn't work. There we go. And the key to this, of course, is that data has basically three motivations around its strategy. Everybody would like to go straight to the end, improving the way your data and your people support your organizational strategy, but you generally can't do that because your data is not in good shape. Data points to where valuable things are. It has intrinsic value in and of itself, and it has some wonderful combinatorial value that we use. But nobody's data is in the shape they'd like it to be in. And with 80% of the data being rot, it's not even clear that you have a good return on investment of cleaning it up until you have first culled the data and gotten rid of the parts that are not able to do that. Similarly, however, we also then need to use data to measure, manage, and motivate change. And your people really don't have much education around how to use data. Finally, once you have improved your data and improved the way people know how to use your data, you can now start to use it in a way that supports your organizational strategy. And I love to tell this story of Rolls-Royce because it's how to create a competitive advantage using your data. Now, Rolls-Royce had an old way of selling things, which was simply to say that they had jet engines that were extremely good. When I get on an airplane, I do not worry that the engines are going to flame out in the middle of the journey. Rolls-Royce jet engines are among the most reliable engine parts ever created. And by the way, it's not just, is it a Rolls-Royce? The other uh, jet engine manufacturers do exactly the same thing. The key, though, was that Rolls-Royce wasn't able to have some conversations with their customers. Because they were selling high-quality products that worked a lot and everybody considered to be a good value, the vendors wouldn't treat them to a conversation. So Rolls-Royce said, hmm, Aside from the fact that the Southwest plane crashed, uh, didn't crash actually, it landed in Philadelphia, but did kill one person, one U.S. aviation death in the last 10 years, wonderful safety record uh, on this. The new model that they put in place was not to sell jet engines, but instead to sell hours of powered thrust which meant that their position in the bargaining was very different. As a vendor, they were across the table, and it was a us-versus-them situation. But with the new model, the new business model, selling hours of power and thrust, they called it, by the way, power by the hour, pretty cool stuff, they could now go and have some other conversations where things they had learned from NASCAR or Formula One or other types of organizations. 
And again, here, this is a little bit of a, a bit, it's an old show of the uh, Indianapolis 500, the way they used to change tires. But Holland comes in for a pit stop. Time to refuel and change tires. Newmore himself changes the so they're just making a comment about changing the tires here. I love the way they change the tires by hitting them with a hammer. So I'm going to shorten that a little bit because it goes a little bit long. He changes the tire, and we'll skip, and he'll change the other tire. There he goes on the other side, putting the tire back on. Get a little bit more. As Holland moves away just 67 seconds after he stops. So if you couldn't hear the audio on that, 67 seconds to change two tires. And our new measure, four seconds, four tires. Now, that type of business result can happen, but that entire conversation couldn't take place until Rolls-Royce changed their business model. And the new wing-to-wing -wing process helps all of us flying consumers because when they can change an engine on an airplane faster, it means we will make our connections faster. Now, the key thing at the end of this little vignette on Rolls-Royce is when was this new business model invented? And the answer is 1962. Oh my goodness, in 1962, Rolls-Royce had decided that this was an important part of their business and that they needed to move forward on this. And the only way they were going to be able to do a good job of all of this was by having different conversations with their customers. If they didn't have those conversations with them, they could never get to this model and never be able to use this. So this is the type of thing that governance and strategy working hand in hand in can help your organizations also achieve these sustained competitive advantages, which is what all organizations want to do. Unfortunately, the sustained competitive advantage is only good for about three years. So that does give you a little bit of a timeline here, and it questions whether that sustained competitive advantage is good, but I'll take three years as opposed to no years in order to do this. So again, our data strategy is critical for data governance because if you don't use your data strategy to improve your data, as well as improve the way your people use their data, you will not be able to help your people use your data to support your strategy better. Let's move on now a little bit further where we get into some prerequisites for this because most of the time people like to try to do this, but unfortunately they are not quite ready. So let's talk about the lack of organizational readiness that they have, the failure to compensate for the lack of data competence in here, and again, the seven data strategies that we, excuse me, seven data deadly sins that we talked about before. Data strategy has some prerequisite. To do it well, you need to get good at it. It's not quite the 10,000 hours that Malcolm Gladwell wants you to have to become an expert, but it does require some prerequisites before you can get to the point of lather, rinse, and repeat. And those prerequisites fall into a couple of categories. The first one is an organizational change category. If we don't get the organization set up to do some change and understand that things are going to be different, there is no way we will be able to just do it from a technology plate. Remember, 95% of our data problems are people and process problems, not technology problems. There's another component that goes into it too, which is that you've got to find the right type of talent in order to pick it up and eliminate the things that are going to cause you problems within there. Let's take a look at the change management aspects of it real quick. First of all, people like me run around the world saying that while CIOs are good and do a great job on the most part, DIOs are not really doing a great job with data. If they were, then we would not be on this call. So we've got this wonderful scenario where people like me are going around the world and saying, CIOs aren't. That was actually the title of the book that I wanted to put out, but uh, they said, uh, if you want to alienate an entire class of individuals, you know, go right ahead for it. 
So instead, I put out a book called The Case for the Top Data Job uh, on this, and uh, they even made me change that title to uh, The Case for the CDO because they figured nobody was going to understand what a top data job was. Now, interestingly, when this book got translated into Chinese, it was translated as Chief Data Officer Combat. So I thought there they were at least able to get a good idea of what was going on in this. Because when you do introduce something like this into an organization, you get the fear, doubt, and uncertainty that comes to mind. Uh, Mario Faria, who's a great analyst for Gartner, uh, did a really good article on that, and I've given you the link there that uh, describes that. So luckily, we are faced with a situation where things need to change dramatically in our organizations, and there's a class of professionals who do an absolutely awesome job with all of this. They are called change management and leadership consultants. You probably have them in your organization. I'm talking to you right now at Virginia Commonwealth University, and we've got them here at the university as well. And what we're really trying to do is to make it harder to do it the old way than it is to do it the new way uh, in that. The organizational change doesn't happen easily. In fact, it's kind of like a, a lock, a, a, um, a key lock, the physical locks, not the electronic ones that we do. So if I look at a, a company and I see anxiety, but I see that they've got a vision, a strategic vision, they've got some incentive and some resources and an action plan, I know that what they're missing is some skills. And if I see frustration, I know they've got the vision that they want to go strategically, they've got incentive to make people move it, they've got the skills, they've got an action plan, but there's no resources. In this little diagram here, Mary Lippert has pulled a wonderful set of things that show that only when you have the vision, the skills, the incentive, the resources, and the action plan do you actually end up with change in the organization. And these are components that are going to go into the process of learning to use data strategically because culture is the biggest barrier, biggest impediment to our shifting our way of thinking about organizational data. I don't have time on this webinar to do this, but I did create a case study on this, and you're welcome to go out and download it. So when Shannon sends you the slides, just click on that link. It's live, and it'll get you right to that particular case study. Again, dramatic change in organizations. If we don't get that dramatic change, then we have an issue. Similarly, we need to find talented people to do this. Sometimes you will be able to find them internally. Sometimes you will not. Let's take a look at how this works most of the time when organizations attempt to do this. They have some business needs, and they take those business needs and translate them into some sort of a solution or roadmap. Again, makes perfect sense, but ah, it's the wrong way to do it. And the reason is we're leaving out an important part of the equation. What is the current level of preparedness in the existing organization? How lined up are they to do the kinds of work that needs to be done? And only when there is a match between the business needs and the current state of the organization are we likely to find something that is going to be successful around that. Why is that the case? Well, the answer is pretty straightforward. We teach our knowledge workers nothing about data. And yet, my definition of a knowledge worker is somebody who works with data. Now, that's bad enough for our workforce, but our IT professionals, it's much, much worse. We tend, as a rule, for the last 30 years, we have taught our IT workers exactly one thing about data. So all the classes we teach them, and the one thing that talks about data, we give them a course in how to build a new database. If there is a skill we do not need any more of on the planet Earth, it is how to build a new database. There's another problem with this, though. In addition to lacking information with people who are building these things and not knowing it, our leadership has also gone through these programs. And when you look at a program that says there's 10 things you need to learn about in IT, and the only thing we're going to teach you about how to do data is how to build a new database, it's no wonder that that is the solution to every proposed problem. Oh, yeah, well, what they taught me in school was that when I have a data problem, I build a new database. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining. This is what is keeping us all employed and will keep us all employed for a great number of years, but it does speak to a rather significant disservice that we've done here. 
we can actually go back and look. And we've got these scientific papers, if you want to read about them, that shows that IT and, and particular data within IT used to report directly into a CIO and has now been pushed down almost three levels in a matter of a short 20 years. We've not had changes like that occur in most major organizations on that degree of rapidity. And what this means is that our leaders have gone through this and said, I need data people only when I need to build a new database. So if I'm migrating databases, I'm not creating a new one, and I don't need organizational data management. If I'm implementing a new software package, I'm not creating a new database. Oh, there's a script that rolls out a database, but I'm not designing a database. So therefore, I also don't need data management requisites or data skills. If I'm installing an ERP, the list goes on and on and on. And what it really comes down to is that most organizations have little idea what data that they have. They don't know where it is, and they don't know what their knowledge workers are doing with it. And that unfortunately leads to a series of bad data decisions. It's no surprise that a large number of companies report these. But when you have business decisions, decision makers that are not daily knowledgeable, and you have technology decision makers that are also not data knowledgeable, then we have a problem where we end up with a lot of bad data decisions. And those bad data decisions result in poor treatment of organizational data assets, poor quality data, and of course from there, poor organizational outcomes. Now we'd like to get off this treadmill. Again, this is the lather, rinse, and repeat stuff that we have as a big problem, but I want you to imagine your organization going out and sitting down to interview somebody for a chief data officer position. How can the people at leadership know what they're trying to hire when we don't even have a body of knowledge around that ourselves? And we're seeing an awful lot of data leaders burn out on the very first one. We tend to say that most organizations, most data leaders in organizations trying to do use data strategically will not succeed the first time, that they will need several attempts in order to do it. And think about this from another perspective, too. If I'm going to go in and change a bunch of things in the organization, I just talked about the need for organizational change management in these areas. Are those knowledge and skills the same ones we need to have as a data scientist to fully exploit the data? Absolutely not. So you may want to look at phasing your data strategy in over a spot that says, first, let's hire somebody that can get something changed, and second, let's hire somebody for running things on a more smooth operational type basis. So this then is the how do you recruit the knowledgeable staff and talent in there? And the best way to do it is to talk to other data professionals and find out what they know. You're not going to find your people who are above you know a whole lot about the characteristics of what it needs to be to be a good data leader and to do data from a strategic perspective. So now we're going to briefly go through the seven deadly sins that are problematic in this area, too. First one we've already talked about, failing to address the data, uh, the culture issues. There are some sequencing issues in data. And most organizations, they spend an awful lot more on IT because of bad data decisions. And if you can help that organization by saving time and money right up front and then using that money to invest in things later on, it's a whole lot easier than asking for thousands or millions of dollars in order to do it later on. There's a number of sequencing components that are important. You have to manage expectations. Again, nobody looks at you planting tomato seeds and expects to eat those tomatoes on Friday. But we've got tremendous unrealistic expectations that are occurring in this field. The data program has to be aligned with IT projects. And I'm using the words deliberately there. So IT projects are the way IT is rolling and should roll out. No problem at all with that. But data cannot exist successfully in organizations if it only is constituted on a project-by-project -project basis. A program is a much more important way of dealing with this because it ties things in a lot better. We also need a robust programmatic means of sharing the data, which means that you shouldn't start any sort of development activities if you don't have the data components ready to go. Now, one of the questions that comes up on these is that I'm trying to do my data strategy, but those Agile stuff keeps getting in the way because everybody wants to move faster. Well, Agile is the best way of developing higher quality software faster. 
But if you want Agile to do work in this, and you are working on an Agile sprint, and you discover you have a data problem, you need to pull the ripcord on that and stop working on that sprint, because the only possible outcome in an Agile format is more small piles of data. And that's probably not the outcome that everybody is attempting to get. Second one. Leadership, we addressed that earlier, but we do need to have it in place and understanding what data thinking is, data-centric thinking. Now, Dataversity has done a number of events that we've done over the years where we've talked about what it means to do this. We've got some ideas around this in terms of the data doctrine, and there's a number of things that get there. There's a little website out there if you want to go jump into that discussion or come to some of the events that we've got upcoming on all of these things. So. These prerequisites are really going to hurt. And I just want you to imagine trying to go through the three major classes of things I've just described, organizational readiness, lack of data competencies on the part of individuals, and those seven deadly data sins that we have, and then picking up a 100-page data strategy document that is typically of what I see in organizations and trying to make it work. It is a guaranteed failure, and I can name outright on my 10 fingers, a number of these things that I've seen that have just been absolutely disastrous in terms of getting people ready to do this. So let's take it to the next step here, which is the next phase, if you will. Once we've eliminated the prerequisites, how do we actually start to get this to work? And the answer is we need to go into something where we talk about lathering, rinsing, and repeating, the process, which is much more important than the actual outcome. Some of you will have read a book called The Goal. I know I did and was actually required to read it uh, by a, a very dear friend of mine who said, I'm not going to talk to you about this stuff unless you go through and read this book. The Goal talks about these five steps. We're going to come back to those five steps, but it evolves around something called a theory of constraints. And we're applying that same theory here. So The Goal, again, wonderful book. You can pick up a copy of it for five bucks on Amazon. I just looked because my students are going to read it this semester. The theory of constraints says that in any system, it's being limited by a small number of constraints, kind of like a Pareto analysis. 80% of your problems are caused by 20% of whatever it is you're working on in those areas. There's always at least one constraint, and the theory of constraints uses a focused process to identify the constraint and restructure it for the rest of the organization to address it. The chain is no stronger than the weakest link, and the data links in most organizations are absolutely weaker when you compare them to some of the other aspects of IT that's going on in that area. Now, Golderat died in 2011, but his book has provided an awful lot of things out there. Most importantly, the whole DevOps movement is focused around this theory of constraints. So when somebody says, well, DevOps will solve all of our problems, DevOps is a definite step in the right direction, but DevOps still does not really address data. It's more about code in terms of how that works out. So let's see how these five steps actually work. Five-step process at the generic level outside of data is to identify the constraint. It may be a machine on a machine floor. It may be an executive in your organization that doesn't understand data. It may be your systems. But something is keeping your data from being more helpful to the organization achieve its competitive advantage and the goals of the strategy. Identify that constraint and then exploit it. Try to get some quick improvements around it. Sometimes it's just the visibility that will help out. More often it takes a little bit more work to do it that way though, which means you need to subordinate everything else that isn't the constraint. We probably have too many IT projects, too many things on our data plate that we'd like to do that we need to take a step back from and say, let's eliminate everything except the essential that we're doing here. Subordinate all of other things to other constraints. If the constraint still persists, then we need to restructure around that constraint. And finally, repeat until that constraint is eliminated. So that is the theory of constraints. And if we move it into the data world, using your data, what that does is 
what is the area that our organization is most being blocked from from achieving success strategically and how data can support it. Exploit that constraint. Try to correct it operationally. Fix it without restructuring. If that doesn't work, improve your data evolution activities to ensure a singular focus on that objective. Don't let it become another thing. When you discover you have a flat tire in your car, you stop driving, right? And there's many of these IT projects that have bad data flat tires and that they kill, still keep driving in here. You may need to restructure to address that constraint and, again, keep repeating until we actually address the strategy all the way around. Now, each of these components in here allows the organization to get better at what they do, just in exactly the same way that Bruce Springsteen's band has been playing with him for 40 years. So they can look at him and tell what song he's going to play next, even though he won't write down a set list for them. I'm not saying your organizations need to be as empathetic as Bruce Springsteen's uh, organization, but it won't hurt to get better at teamwork all the way around in these areas. Because once you've got that part of things set up the way you want, you can go back to your business needs. Again, remember, we don't like that initial solution because most organizations forget to consider the state of the existing organization in there in order to pull these two pieces together. Only when we have that match do we then start to execute, and now the new part of this is we make a roadmap. And our roadmap for our data strategy is a very important aspect. We have to do a balance between delivering some business value, showing some progress in attaining our strategic objectives from a data perspective, and we also have to get everybody better at what they're doing, practicing. Now, if you do too much on the left-hand side of this diagram where you're delivering business value and delivering business value, we tend to see that organizations become dependent on a method or a person much more so than is healthy. And if that person gets promoted or the method proves uh, inadequate to some form, then we have problems there. On the other hand, if I weigh the outputs of my strategy too much on the right-hand side there with new capabilities, that management says, well, okay, when are you going to get them to me? And we say five years. Remember, the average CIO is only in their job from two to four years these days. So if you're talking about a five-year payoff, the CIO is not going to think you can be part of their success. In addition to that, just to give you a comparable measure, organizations with CIOs and CFOs, those organizations that have them in the same organization, right? those organizations that have them both, um, the CIOs tend to stay two to four years, but the CFOs tend to stay 12 years. And that is a tremendous difference, three to four times longer than a CIO in place. So you've got to understand that you need to tie your successes in the data area around something that will be lasting and notable, that will make a difference to the organization. Failure to do that means you will end up with a situation where you have a nice data strategy document that sits there on the shelf, but you're never given the resources. And even when you try to do it, the business isn't ready to absorb the changes that you're making in the data resource area. So this data strategy framework is an absolutely key document to make sure that you have out there, but also make sure that people understand you're creating a data strategy as a small series of data steps that you can take small, little bite-sized chunks away from it, one step at a time by focusing on things. Now, again, I'll go back to the idea around projects, IT projects. Most of the time when I work with companies, one of the things I like to understand is how many people they have in IT. So a company I'm working with right at the moment has about 300 people in IT, and they've got 500 projects going. Now, that's a crazy number. I'm sorry, but that's nuts. That means every person in your IT organization gets to work on some part of a project for some part of the day, but nobody's really putting time and attention into it. And the organization is getting bled to death by 1,000 cuts, or in this case, 500 cuts. And what needs to happen there is that somebody needs to go back and say, which of these projects are really essential to the organization? And more importantly, which of those projects are dependent on data in order to get us from where we are to where we want to be? 
practicing that process is exactly what I want all of you all to do as you're out there trying to help your organizations do more with your data. So let's give a quick recap on some of this. Strategy is an inherently repetitive process that can be improved. Most people don't think of strategy that way. But if you have somebody in your organization that has worked with the military who invented the term strategy, they will tell you exactly that is why the military does what it does in the way it does. Because the military does not know what they're going to encounter when they are in a battle. And so by drilling, by repeating exercises, by doing things over and over again, data strategy is a much better way to approach it by saying, hey, let's fix a little thing and let's try it, and we get good at this process of fixing things, we will then be better able to take on some of the more challenging projects that we need to face in data, such as, for example, implementing a master data management solution, just to pick one off the top of our heads where we've got lots and lots of possibilities. So if we're going to go out and implement an MDM, let's not spend a lot of money with huge consultants and things to figure out. Let's instead figure out how to use master data strategically in our organization. And you can do that not by spending $60 million and hiring 60 uh, people. There's literally three plane loads of people that I, I saw at this one organization that I was working with who would come in and, and, and you know, work and put this beautiful solution. The technology worked really well. But then I'm walking the halls of the organization after they spent $60 million on this thing, and I hear, well, I couldn't figure out where to stick the data, so I stuck it in the MDM. Well, that is not using data strategically. And it's certainly not practicing, and more importantly, recognizing that the process of using data strategically in your organization is an inherently repetitive process that can be easily improved. I see too many organizations where they have a data strategy that's trying to drive the business strategy. It may be that your data strategy is, in fact, a better way of going than the organization is going. But if you don't make your data strategy so that it clearly supports the organizational strategy, nobody's going to pay attention to you. We only exist to support the organizational strategy. And what we do is we support it with the most dynamic resources, the non-durable, non-depletable resources that we have in our organization. And those resources as types of resources that have much different value and are much, much different characteristics are much more important to the organization strategy all the way around. That the process of doing this, particularly at the early stages of maturity, is much more important than the output. Again, we send our students out of here and say, you're not going to get everything right in IT when you go out. Well, same thing is true for data. Your first part of your data, oh, by the way, a very important piece of data strategy, always number them. If you hand somebody a data strategy with the version 1 on it, they're more likely to expect version 2 to come along presently. Whereas if you hand them your data strategy and then another year later somebody else says, well, I didn't like that data strategy, so here's the next one, your question is what's wrong with the first one? Wouldn't it be a better story to say, hey, we achieved all the goals that we were trying to on data strategy number one, and that's why we have data strategy number two, because we're now going to start working on different things in another way to help the organization. At the early phases of this, process is much more important than product. The outputs that you get are going to be of limited value, and you're always going to have obstacles, particularly in the early phases on this. Technology is a small part of what's going on. Again, the people and the process aspects of this are much more important. And getting to Nirvana, how does one get to Carnegie Hall? The answer is, of course, practice, practice, practice. So we're approaching the top of the hour, and I'll do a quick little summary here, and then we'll get to the question and answers. Again, a data strategy specifies how the data assets of your organization are used to help support the organizational strategy. But of course, if you don't know what a strategy is, and not knowing what a data strategy is or how they work together, you're going to have difficulty implementing it, and that's what we see most organizations struggling with. Data strategy is also the thing that keeps your data governance organization focused on objectives. 
I've seen so many data strategy meetings where people are going, well, we're talking about this and we're doing that. And one of the more popular talks I give these days is called Rekindling Your Data Governance because people kind of get bogged down. And if you have a strategy that says we're going to help improve our data, we're going to help improve the way people use our data so that we can take that improved data and those improved capabilities and use them in support of the organizational strategy, governance becomes much more focused and much more practical. Now, a lot of people will tell me that's not what data governance is about. I'm sorry, I don't care what data governance is about. I care what is the organization achieving and how can data be used to support that. We talked about a number of prerequisites. I went through them fairly briefly here. Lots and lots of more detail on some of these others and uh, some older websites, uh, sorry, older uh, webinars that you can go back to. And finally, when you do get to the point where you've got the ability to go in and start to practice this, it's like sitting down with a piece of music and trying to play that song every single day. As you go through the process of focusing in on the theory of constraints and finding out where a lack of data capabilities is hurting your organization's ability to achieve its strategic objectives, and then taking small, careful steps to move those things from the negative column to the positive column, that is where you will succeed as you're starting to do data strategy. And again, you can see this is about not the plans, but about the planning process. That's what will help your organization in the long run achieve success that it's likely to do. Uh, again, I apologize for the technical difficulties at the beginning of this thing. We didn't really miss a lot. You'll get all the slides, and it's now time to turn it back over to Shannon for our Q&A session. Peter, thank you so much for this great presentation, especially after the rough start, as you mentioned. appreciate all the patience there. Um, and if you have questions for Peter, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, I, again, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides, links to the recording, and anything else requested throughout. Um, uh, Peter, so... Please discuss the role that metadata plays in data strategy. Sure. Um, let me jump around for a couple of different slides here to emphasize a couple of points here. Really good question. Metadata is generally referred to as data about data. And so the role of metadata within here also speaks to the general way in which our organizations are not approaching uh, data. Now, I glossed over this point a little bit earlier, but I think it's worth going back and repeating. In 2017, uh, Randy Bean, Tom Davenport survey that they do, and again, they do this every year, so we'll get the, the new one sometime coming up. 37% of the firms that were out there self-identified as being data-driven. And in 2018, that number had dropped to 32%, and for the 2019 survey, it was 31%. So I think this is actually kind of good news. And the good news is that people are understanding things like metadata and realizing they don't have a good handle on it. One of the documents I'm trying to create, and maybe this is where our, our wonderful data community can, can help us out, is I'm trying to draw a picture of all of the things data. It's kind of like the blind man and the elephant sort of scenario. So we've got data scientists that think, ah, I've got everything to do with data and there's nothing else important in here except for me. On the other hand, I went to a data engineering meeting in a, a city recently where they, their definition of data engineering was, uh, in this case, ETL. And they said, if it's not ETL, we don't want to talk about it. Well, each of these are correct, but each of them are also the blind people coming up to the elephant. One's picking up the trunk and saying, well, you know, this thing, the elephant is kind of like a snake, right? It's got sort of long and thin and moves about and wiggles and all this sort of thing. And, and somebody else has picked up the, the tail and said, no, no, it's more like a broom. It's got this wispy thing on it, right? All of their perspectives are correct, but none of them have a full perspective on it. Metadata being data about data needs to be just recognized as data. So the main thing that most organizations have trouble with from a strategy is that they will say something like, our goal at the strategic level is to have the metadata for the entire PeopleSoft system by the end of the third quarter. And while that may be a good goal, if you don't say, and that data will help us then to reduce the amount of time that we spend 
messing with the highly customized modules of pay and personnel in there, then there's no point in it. So metadata is the idea that we are going to be managing some data with extra care, using it at a, perhaps a higher level of abstraction as we do it, and being able to work within those particular constructs. If we don't have good management of our metadata, there is no way that we will have good management of our data. Great question. I hope that answered it. Definitely. So uh, this is more of a statement, Peter, but uh, I'm going to read it here for you so for you to comment on. In real life, most of uh, data knowledgeable people, such as people who join this seminar, don't have too much influence on the uh, to the organization leadership decisions. Data strategy is made by high management. If they don't really know the correct concept, how and what do we do? That is a great question and a wonderful way of expressing something that's been frustrating us collectively as a community for a long, long time. The only thing we can do is to show that we can achieve results. And if we achieve results, people will pay attention to it. And as, we pay it to, as they pay more attention to us, we will start to get invited to meetings that perhaps we weren't invited to before. Because you're exactly right, as I said on my data decisions slide that's back there, that is a huge, huge problem for organizations where they just don't know that decisions that are made to prioritize some things over other things is an issue. I go back to my slide of, of defining data governance because that's exactly right. And, and by the way, part of your strategy has got to be focused in on helping the people in the data governance organization also understand this. So while most people appreciate a dis uh, discussion around <coughs> managing data with guidance, it's really the decisions. And those decisions are so important. And if we are not at the table for those decisions, then that's a problem for us. Um, I can relate a specific story, and I can, I can feel the pain for the, the, the questioner in here. I was with the Defense Department for a number of years, and I had a wonderful boss uh, who would say to my boss, so it's my boss's boss, I guess, um, and, and say, hey, you know, can you give me a one-half-page decision memo? that I can get generals to read in the middle of a decision so they'll make the right decision. And I need that, by the way, on Friday morning at 10 o'clock when the meeting is. And my boss, bless his heart, was good, but he would come back and give her a 20-page thing and say, I can't condense it any more than this. It needs to be 20 pages. Well, I'm sorry, a general officer is not going to read a 20-page document any more than your CEO or your CIO is going to read a 20-page document. So we've got to get people into those meetings that understand what they're doing. Part of it's a maturation process, but the other part of it is the more you demonstrate value, the easier it will be to have people invited to various meetings. I agree 100% with the sentiment, and it is a tough, tough problem that we have. And you mentioned, you know, that one book, one of your books had the top data job in the title. You know, what, and so what is the top uh, data job? Is it really the CDO or is it sometimes the CIO, CTO, et cetera? A real good question. I have seen data people work at all levels of the organization. My definition for the top data job is the highest uh, person with the highest responsibility for data in the organizations. I prefer to call it that, and there's a couple of reasons. The CDO, even though we kind of you know, accept that as a title, the first thing that happens in most organizations is that they say, do we need another chief around here? And when you're having that discussion, you've completely derailed the purpose of it, which is that all you were trying to do was do more with data so that you could help the organization achieve more. One of my slides a couple back, it said that 60% of data people still report in to the IT organizations out there. Now, CDO is fine. I like the title Enterprise Data Executive because that can exist at any level of the organization. And so I would say, to all of you out there who are data leaders, go ahead and make up a sign and put it on your desk and say, I am the data leader for this organization. Because sometime sooner or later, somebody's going to come by and say, hey, who told you you could be in charge of that? In which case, you can pick up the sign and say, oh, well, if it doesn't belong on my desk, whose desk should it be on? After all, there is somebody in charge of IT. There is somebody who's in charge of HR. There's somebody who's in charge of finance. If we're going to say that data and IT are managed together, 
and expect to achieve better results than we have been, which I think we'll all admit are not optimal, then we're really shooting ourselves in the foot. So make that sign, put it on your desk, and that sign will help people to crystallize the nature of the argument. While IT is important, and IT leadership has done a lot of good, data has been less mature than those areas. So a chief data officer is a fine way to say it. It's now a part of federal law. Uh, most, I think we have 26 states now that have chief data officers that are out there. Um, lots and lots of things that are happening, but it's not happening fast and it's not happening in a way that results are out there. I mean, think, think about this for a minute. Every state is having to relearn the lessons. Why aren't all 50 states getting together and saying, how can we use our data more efficiently to support our citizenry? And they, they insist on learning it themselves because they are afraid to share information back and forth. If we describe a class of data leaders in here as chief data officers, then at least we could have a chief data officers conference for the states. By the way, I know they did have a conference, they just didn't accomplish much other than getting together uh, on that because they had sort of the wrong motivations around that event. But we're working on it, working on it with all of them. Anyway, data leadership is something we're going to be working on and continue to work on and is not, again, a fully baked idea just yet. So you touched on this a little bit in your answer there. Um, could the existing organization structure hinder the implementation of good strategy? Well, I'll tell you the most the thing that is hindering implementation of data strategy most in most organizations. And again, I do have extensive experience around this and, and some good scientific data that we can look at as well if you need to see the numbers on it. Data cannot exist as a project. And so even though we've taught our students for the past 50 years that you can, with one systems development lifecycle approach, create all of your data and all of your um, uh, IT needs out of a single life cycle, we've seen over the years that that is simply incorrect. And that data, in order to exist as an asset, has to have a programmatic management around it. And managing data programmatically is completely the opposite of the way most IT shops should function. So we have an inherent disconnect between the structure of these two things. IT projects are perfectly appropriate, should be done, do a great job. We're getting better at it. Data is not a project. And until we recognize that data to be most valuable has to exist at the programmatic level, and that's what data governance programs are designed to do, is to support data as an organizational asset. If we don't have that in place, then we can't count on much else happening good. So that was terrible English, wasn't it, Shannon? <laughs> well, forgive it. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> You couldn't hear me cursing when I was trying to get the machine up and running. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So uh, you discussed the process is more important than the outcome and agree with that, um, but what do you think are the most important deliverables of data strategy study? Ah, fantastic question. So let's go back a little bit. Uh, let's see, not that one. Hey, this is pretty cool. I'm using my new MacBook and I can touch buttons on it. It'll take me to the right slides. That's really neat. Anyway, um, the outputs from this should occur in two places. I should change something in the business. Now, here's where we have trouble. As a profession, I'm certainly not speaking directly to anybody because many of you have, have done some really, really good things in your own areas. Um, but if I just produce a data result, we have a thing that happens, data things happen in the organization. And what we need to do is to show how data things happening in the organization, because we tend to stop there and say, hey, we got all the metadata for PeopleSoft or whatever it is we're trying to do. We need to take it the next step, which is more work, is more difficult, takes longer, but will result in better value, and say that the value of that PeopleSoft metadata is this. So there's two things that have to come out of each of these cycles that we do. One, something that is a tangible business value. 
if you're producing something that doesn't produce something of business value, the organization is right to ask the question, why are we doing this? But the second thing that happens as a result of this as well is that every exercise that you do should have increased documentation reporting, where when you go in to change something, to move something, to enhance something, keep that metadata and add it to your corporate business glossary, to your repository, whatever types of things that you have in place that make sure that this reference material is available for the next individual. I could tell you a story of one organization that I worked with that literally had gone out, two, two of the developers had gone out to lunch and figured out how to do some tax calculations, and they brought it back to me because they said, hey, Peter, we know you love metadata. Here's some metadata for you, and they threw down a napkin, literally stuff scrawled on a napkin. And you know what? We took a picture of it and put it in the metadata repository. It turned out it was the most highly accessed piece of metadata that we had because it was describing a really important process. And everybody went, whoa, they've already done it once. We don't need to do it again. So we've actually got something that we can have. So the outputs from these cycles are increased knowledge of your people, which means you have to have a baseline knowledge in there. We're going to get into that in a little bit, the, another whole category that Shannon and I are plotting around uh, do this. But you've got to raise the data literacy in your organization up to a, a, a minimal level, or at least the decision makers who are making decisions about this understand what they're doing. So output has to be a combination of business value, some additional metadata, clarifications, more detail about what you're doing, and also some improved knowledge around people who are making these decisions. Absent those three things, yeah, you're right, it's a very tough process. I love these discussions and great questions coming in here. Uh, so, if you uh, if you're if using data centric strategies, get projects done about fifty percent or more faster, then won't you grow uh, value grow as well? Yes, although I'm not sure where the fifty percent. Did I say that in there? Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. but, but but you're right. Put put a number on it anyway. Yes, and and that's the whole point. We want to make things faster, better, and and uh, more functional for our organizations. And so the idea is if we can decrease the time it takes us to do these things, again, my example is each of the 50 states wasting their time relearning the same lessons over and over again that they could easily share among themselves. Uh, banks are doing it already. You know, they're, they're, they're being able to, to focus in on these things. The idea is if we can increase the rapidity, this actually moves us more towards the goals that people say when they say, why aren't you doing Agile? Now, again, Agile is a good way of developing higher quality software faster. But Agile is a project mentality. And only when you have good known data quality elements that you're starting that Agile sprint with should you proceed on the sprint. Because if you move down that sprint without good data, the only result is more small piles of data. And again, guaranteed employment for all of us on the phone call here. Got to love that. So uh, how would you demonstrate that a decision is a data decision if the organization views it as some other kind of decision? That's a great question. So the organization is looking at buying a new software package. A important process of evaluating software packages should be that your organization um, should request from any vendors that are, supposing, that are proposing to sell you some software, that they also give you a logical data model of the package because that should be part of your evaluation process. So while you may buy a cheap package that doesn't cost a lot of money, it may be incompatible with your existing data and will actually, the total cost of ownership go way, way up instead of buying a package that was more compatible with your organization and having the integration costs be much, much lower. That's just one example. There's lots and lots of them. And again, this is the purpose of our community here so that we can all contribute these examples. So hopefully everybody on the call here will come away with a lot more knowledge about what it is we're trying to do. Hope that answered. Indeed. And would you say it's accurate to state that data management is the umbrella and broader category under which data strategy and data governance fall? Could you repeat that one? I want to make sure I heard it correctly. Sure. Kinda. Uh, would you say it's accurate to state that data management is the umbrella and broader category under which data strategy and data governance fall? Yes, 100%. Uh, so again, I don't t tend to pick 
nits about the labels, but I agree with the questions labels here uh, on that, which is, the, again, to say that data strategy is one of the important things that data management does. I like to just call it data at the top because that's usually most everybody's understanding of it. I mean, again, several people have reference to our little bubble that we live in here in the data world, which is a good place to live, and, and, and we're making some progress here. But most people wouldn't know the difference between data management and data science at this point, and that's sad. That's how level, how 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 wide the the misunderstanding of this area is throughout the entire world. And frankly, I've seen a lot better results of places that did not have the education systems that we've had here. When I go overseas and work with groups that are there, they do it because it makes sense, but we've actually taught them wrong in the traditional Western style of describing IT projects to them. Absolutely. And Peter, where can one find an example of data strategy? <laughs> well, if you Google the phrase data strategy, you'll see several organizations, including parts of the federal government, that have lots of data strategies on there. Um, I would also say that if it's longer than a couple of pages, you might want to read it once but not really do much with it. A good data strategy should be a very clear statement about what you're going to fix next at the programmatic level so that you can do data better in your organization. Let me go back to that one slide where I have the, the actual specifics of it on there. Um, it's just very important to not try to over plan these things because everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, as Mike Tyson has so helpfully told us. So again, our data strategy should be a very high level guidance. Okay, we're going to do this. Again, we're going to start to learn about how to do master data from a strategic perspective. That's very different from we're going to implement an MDM project, right? It should also then be focused on specific business goals. Not I'm going to do this for the sake of coming up with something nice, but I'm going to do something in a way where somebody in the business says, oh my, that was extremely helpful to us by being able to do that. And then finally, of course, you got to have guidance when you're faced with a stream of decisions. If I'm a soldier in Napoleon's army, I know the first thing I have to do is hit them very hard, and the second thing I have to do is turn to the right, and the third thing I have to do is turn to the left. If I get any one of those three steps wrong, I will probably, in this case, die. Of course, we don't want to have that happen on our dying on our data strategies, but we do need to make things as basic and as simple as that because everybody's got to get the understanding of it. I love it. And if you have a question for Peter, feel free to submit it in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. I'll give everyone a moment here um, as we – that has been all the questions so far. Uh, and just a comment, Peter, you know, you, you're talking about practicing. And you, you actually practice your music? That's crazy. Of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. Well, that is all the questions that we have for today. Peter, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation and kicking off the new year with this with this topic. Uh, again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, links to the recording of the session. Uh, and I hope you all have a great day. Again, thanks for the patience as we got started a little bumpy this morning, but we, we got it going. So um, it was great. Yeah, thank you. So thank much. you, and thank everybody, and we'll talk to you guys next month. We're, what's our topic next month? Ah, yeah. <laughs> what is our topic next month? It's uh, let me pull it. it. I, I got it. There we go. <laughs> data have architecture memory. versus data modeling. Contrasting. Oh, and that's a good one. That's a great one. Right. Looking forward to it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Ciao.